Well, our sermon series is on holistic health. Today will be the day that we wrap up this four-week sermon series. And I'm very excited about the potential of what this sermon series can do in our own personal lives and how it affects our own personal worship. What is holistic health? On the slide, you should see the definition of the word holistic. As an adjective, this is what it means. It is the philosophy characterized by comprehension of the individual parts of something as intimately interconnected and explicable only by reference to the whole. As I've tried to share this the first three weeks at the beginning of each sermon, I'm trying to help you to understand that when you have individual parts just laying around by themselves, they're not of much use. But when you can bring them together and intimately interconnect them and they make a whole, that whole now can do what it was designed and created to do. For instance, we started out talking about a motor and putting a motor together and having all the parts laying around in your garage, putting the motor together. Now the parts all fit together in such a way you have a powerful engine that can drive you somewhere. But all the parts laying in your garage, if it's not assembled, it does you no good. You still own the motor, you still own the parts, but it's not intimately interconnected and it can't do anything for you until you put it together as a whole. Now let's talk about the human body. If I go lay this arm over there, I lay this arm over here, I put that ear by Chuck's foot, I take this ear and put it by John Sparenberg, and I take my foot and I put it by Hal, or I take my elbow and put it by Dale, and you spread out all of my individual body parts within this room, the parts intimately are not interconnected. They will not suffice as a human being body. But if my body is together as it is right now, it is of use to me. And that is what I gain from the picture of holistic worship, wholehearted worship. God doesn't just want my heart to worship Him, but also my soul, my mind, my strength. He wants my total being to worship Him. Well, last week's sermon was on mind health, having good mental health when we worship and our sermon today is on strength, health, your body's health. And we're still in Mark chapter 12, verses 30 to 31. We've been breaking down these two verses for a month. Two verses for an entire month. On the screen, you should be able to see now this verse. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other greater commandment than these. So whatever else is you're trying to live out for the Lord God through the passages of your Bible from Genesis to Revelation, it would do no good to live out those passages and those commandments and those ordinances from Holy God if you violate the first two greatest ones. Amen? Now, can you separate your heart from your soul? Can you separate your heart from your mind? Can you separate your heart from your strength? Can you separate your heart from your physical body? Can you separate your mind from your physical body? Can you separate your soul from your physical body? The answer, of course, to all of these questions is no. Why? Because last week and the previous two weeks before last week, we learned that our entire makeup is made up of a heart, soul, mind, and body. The only time there's a separation of the soul and the body is that physical death. And we learned that we are supposed to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, which really means to love Him with our total being. So to worship God with our total being really means to worship Him in every way, every day, with our entire body, emotionally, mentally, psychologically, 
physically, spiritually. Do you see how the parts come together? And if you try to separate them out, you can't. But don't we as sinners, yet saints, don't we really have a good way of trying to do that sometimes? I mean, don't we really sometimes have a different life Monday through Friday? Or maybe for the teenagers, something different Friday and Saturday night? But yet Sunday morning you can come and sing praises to God. That is not the individual parts being intimately interconnected to really make the whole function as it should. We should worship Jesus deeply on Friday night at 10 p.m., just as effectively and powerfully as we do Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Amen? Amen? Our bodies are a whole unit. We are therefore to worship wholeheartedly, or we could say holistically. Today we're talking about strength. The Bible has a lot to say about strength. Let's look at some passages. Genesis chapter 4, verse 12. When you cultivate the ground... It will no longer yield its strength to you. What does this mean? The ground God created has strength to grow things. Sometimes the Lord will stop the strength from the ground to produce food for the farmer. If there is sin going on in the land, the Lord may withhold the strength of the ground and it won't grow anything. Genesis chapter 31 verse 6. You know that I have served your father with all my strength. Strength here means giving you the very best I can, doing the best job I can, giving you my all, so to speak. Genesis chapter 48, verse 2. When it was told to Jacob, Behold, your son Joseph has come to you. Israel collected his strength and sat up in the bed. Here, strength means a person has bodily strength to sit up, move around, stand up, that kind of strength. Genesis chapter 49, verse 3. Reuben... You are my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power. Well, what in the world is Jacob talking about here with Reuben? He's talking about his reproductive strength. Jacob is here talking about a man's strength and able to be able to follow a child. Exodus chapter 15, 2. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. This is my Father's God, and I will extol Him. A person can have spiritual strength from God's supernatural strength. Exodus chapter 15, verse 13. In your loving kindness, you have led the people whom you have redeemed. In your strength, you have guided them to your holy habitation. So who was it that really led the people out of Egypt into the promised land? Moses or God? Both. God is the one that gave Moses his spiritual ability, his spiritual leadership, so that a million plus people would follow him with just a staff and leave everything to go where they did not know they were going. God's supernatural strength of leadership was given to Moses. God gave him that ability. Leviticus 26, 20. Your strength will be spent uselessly. For your land will not yield its produce and the trees of the land will not yield their fruit. Here strength is talking about your ability as a human being to work and produce is going to be minimized. You're not going to be blessed with the work of your hands. So God can reduce the strength that you have to produce. Leviticus chapter 26 verse 37. They will therefore stumble over each other as if running from the sword. Although no one is pursuing, and you will have no strength to stand up before your enemies. What does this mean? Strength here means that you will lose courage to fight. You've lost your strength. You've lost your bravery. You've lost your courage. You are just now scared and shaking in your boots. You've lost the strength to fight. It doesn't mean you're tired. You've lost courage. Job chapter 16 verse 5. I could strengthen you with my mouth. And the solace of my lips could lessen your pain. What does this mean? This means that our words are either weak and have little effect on people, or our words have strength and you can strengthen other people. Have you ever been trying to uplift someone, encourage someone, minister to someone, and what you seem seem to turn around their whole atmosphere, their whole day, their whole situation, and they're just, oh, you just shared exactly with me, exactly what I needed to hear. Oh, thank you, sister. Thank you, brother. That was the word I needed to hear. Man, God has blessed me, but 
your words had strength in them, and you blessed them. Now, on the flip, have your words ever cut someone down? Have your words ever been an axe to someone's knees and taken their legs right out from them and taken their own spirit and joy right out of them? Our minds and our bodies have strength. See if you recognize any of these sayings. He has a strong heart. Or she has a strong will to survive. Or he has a strong fortitude, meaning he has a strong attitude. Or he has a strong body but a weak heart. Have you heard that one? His body is weak, but his mind is sharp as a tack. He has the strength of ten men. She doesn't have much strength left in her to fight. Those were pretty strong words he used. On the screen, you should see that there are six areas that a person can have physical strength in their being, in their body. Number one is strength of character. That includes morality, ethical, integrity, etc. Number two, a person can have strength of mind. That means they're mentally strong. They will not break. They have wisdom, knowledge, understanding, etc. Number three, a person can have strength of resolve. That means that they have a lot of determination. They will not quit. They are determined. Point four, a person can have strength of health. That's to have a healthy body like your immune system, your weight, your blood, your blood pressure, your organs, etc. Point number five, a person can have strength of muscle, strong body, bone, muscle, tendons, lung strength, being in shape, etc. Point number six, a person can have strength of faith in Jesus Christ. It means they have spiritual strength and power. So a person can have these six areas of strength in their total being, as we've been talking about Mark 12, verses 30 to 31. Strength of character, strength of mind, strength of resolve, strength of health, strength of muscle, and strength of faith. God wants us to know that He will give us His strength. Isn't that awesome? Have you ever run to the end of your own strength in the areas that we just talked about? Have you ever run to the end of yourself and realized you just didn't have a lot of strength? Did you know that God wants to give you supernatural strength from Himself? It's kind of plugging into the 220. You know what I'm saying? You're really going to plug in to get some of God's power and strength. And you notice by the well-known and famous verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It doesn't say I can do a bunch of things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do most things from Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So if you come to me as a pastor, you're coming for counseling, you're coming for discipleship, you're coming for guidance, I'm going to look back at you and say you have a God that is all-sufficient, all-powerful, almighty, who tells you in His Word you can do things through Christ if you let Him. You say, oh, but Pastor, you don't understand. Oh, you don't understand. You don't understand. You don't, you don't understand what? That's not what God said. God said that a person can say, I can do all things through Christ, not your flesh, through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13 in the list you're looking at on the screen, there are some things that you and I can change. There are things on the screen that you and I can make better, make stronger. There are some things in this list that you cannot make better, that you cannot make stronger. This might be a good time to walk through the first part of the familiar and famous quote by Ryan Cole Niebuhr. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Now let's talk about that for a minute. Let's stop there. There are some things in this list of strengths that a person in a particular season or situation in life cannot change. So quit crying over spilled milk. Move on in God's serenity and peace. You can't change it. It's not within your power to change it. God has not willed it so. So quit wasting that precious time. Now, the next part of Niebuhr's 
saying, courage to change the things I can. You know that there are things in this list of strengths on the screen that you can change. You and I know that God is convicting you and me in that list of things that need to change, that need to grow stronger. You and I will need God's courage to start making these changes day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year. Amen? And you need the wisdom to know the difference. You don't need to waste any more of your precious time and energy on something you cannot change. But we absolutely need to get to work on and change what we can change. The issue is, is that we need to ask God for His wisdom so that He will give us His wisdom to know the difference. So how important is it that we take care of our body and our personal being inside and out? Listen to what God said through the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 12 through 20. Starting at verse 12. All things are lawful for me. He's saying as a Christian, all things are lawful for me because I'm in Christ. But not all things are profitable. Do you realize there are some things that God will allow in your life, but that doesn't mean it's profitable for you. You need to turn away from it. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. And you know what he talks about being mastered by immediately afterwards? Food. Anybody got a master named food? Food is for the stomach and the stomach is for food. But God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord is for the body. Now God has not only raised the Lord, He raised the Lord Jesus Christ from death, but will also raise us up through His power. Meaning when He comes again, He's going to resurrect your dead body and go off to be with Him. Verse 15, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? And we do all kinds of things to our bodies. We tattoo our bodies. We have immorality and sex outside of marriage with our bodies. We do all kinds of things with our bodies that God never intended. Now listen closely. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her, for he says the two shall become one flesh. Verse 17, but the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. What does the word join mean? Join means to connect, mingle together, mix together. Meaning a Christian is one with the Lord, heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then you don't have outside marital sex, you are joining yourself to another person in morality, and you are joining yourself to God in holiness. What a mix. So it's not just about your personal gratification. It has to do with you have joined yourself with the Lord, and so what's really happened is when we go and join ourselves in something immoral, we just took God and brought Him into it too. Because He's part of it. And you just made him part of that sin in your life. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body. But the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? If the Holy Spirit is living in you as a Christian and you are living in an immoral way, it is very, very very ungodly. Watch verse 19. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? If you think you can just take the body that God gave you as a baby from your mother's womb and grow up and treat it any way you desire and do anything with it you want, you are sad and sad. You are not your own if you are a child of God, if you are a Christian, if you are a believer, if you are a follower of Christ. Your body doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. You've been bought with a price and that price was His death and blood. Our country is losing its way in immorality like you would not believe and I'm sorry to say that inside the church, immorality is just as prevalent as in the outside lost world. 
We wonder why the Holy Spirit of God is not doing things today in our country. The Bible says we can grieve Him. We can quench Him. If He's grieved and quenched because He indwells the temple of our body as a believer and we're living in immorality, how would He bless you? He really needs to spank you. And that in itself is a blessing. Because God loves you and disciplines you and says, Stop joining my son with immorality and a lover that is not your spouse. Now, it gets even harder. Now, in the next chapter, God gets even more strict about what He says about how we can neglect our bodies. 1 Corinthians 3, 17. If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy and that is what you are. So, as we wrap up our four-week series on worshiping God through the greatest commandment in the entire Bible, Mark chapter 12, 30-31, And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength, with your total being, with your body. What area of Mark 12, 32, 31 are you needing to work on? Worship is an intimate expression between two people. You and the person of God. Did you know that God's just not a being? And He's not just a thought. He's a person. God the Father. Jesus the Son. The Holy Spirit indwells you. I want to give you a challenge. If you really want Jesus to mean something to you, you've got to show Him that He means something to you. You've got to show Him. You already mean everything to Christ. Would you not say Jesus thoroughly loves you by coming down here and taking your penalty so that you don't go to hell? He dies on the cross, suffers an incredible torturous death so that you don't have to. He said, I love you so much, I'll take that. All of that sin that you committed got put on me. Did you know that it said that anyone who hangs on a tree is cursed? Jesus is holy. And He allowed Himself to be cursed for me and for you. So if Jesus died for us and joined Himself to you when He saved your soul, and you're intimately interconnected with Him, what should our response be back to Him? You are holy with me. I will live holy 